Please have a seat. I love a song that reminds me of the majesty of God and of Jesus. And with things going on in our world right now with floods and fires and what have you, we need a God who reigns and reigns forever. (coughs) And that's what we have. I'm sure that some of you have family or friends in California or Southern California, so I know you have concerns. So today, as we pray and as we speak to the Lord, let's all remember each other in prayer. Bow your heads with me for a moment, please. God, you reign forever. You are the same yesterday, today, forever. You're here in floods and fires and war, and peace, Lord. You're here in our churches, on the streets where many have no place to go, and you are God. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for being there. I pray that this morning we'll remember how fortunate we are that you can speak to us through so many things, so many ways. I pray, Lord, that we'll listen, that we will hear, that we will pray, that we will not give up hope, and that we will know that God reigns forever. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you'd like, please stand with us. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I over. the power of his blood Amen Amen I'm alive I'm alive because he lives Amen Amen Let my song join the one that never ends cause he
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. I apologize for those watching at home. My microphone was on. I couldn't find the online service, so we're back there trying to figure out if it's actually going live or not, and you're hearing me say things. Uh, Fern, sorry about that, Fern. I can tell you're online, so uh, I apologize to you directly. And then maybe later I'll cut this whole part out. I don't know yet. Uh, Today we take a little turn, and I, I have to admit, I haven't been in this book uh, a lot. Uh, we've, been, we've read pieces of it, but I'm, I'm not going to go through the old thing this week or this month, but today we're in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 3, and just getting started. The book of Hebrews chapter 3, oh, here's a fun one, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Yeah, uh, we don't know. Uh, it doesn't say. It doesn't say in the text, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ, and normal stuff. Now, many people think it may have been Paul. And in Hebrews 13, it talks about hanging out with Timothy, 
which sounds like some of the stuff Paul did. So if it wasn't Paul, it was someone standing next to him in the same group of peeps, you know, because they're talking about the same thing. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, I'd give you a bonus award, but you've won too many already. Uh, uh, I did have something at home, too. I had a lovely calendar. I should have brought it. A little, little paper calendar. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore. And let's stop right there. The chapter started off with the word, therefore. He's basing what he's about to say on what he just got through saying. Therefore, based on this, here's our next thought, our next understanding. Here's the completion of the thought. There's the part, first part, and the second part. That indicates that we should actually start in somewhere in Hebrews chapter 2, which I'm not going to do today. That is your homework assignment. Why is he saying therefore? What is he talking about that he now makes this new point? Go home, read at least the back half of Hebrews chapter 2. We'll leave it like it's kind of a cliffhanger for you. Why did he say therefore? What is he talking about? I'll give you a hint. He's talking about Jesus. But what part? What aspect? What attribute? So Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Now, there's often a thought that, you know, Jesus was a nice guy. He did great things. He, uh, but over the years, over the centuries, his followers kind of deified him. Extra myths came up of his great works and all that. But you can tell from the, some of the earliest writings we have, these Christian writings, he was already big in their mind. He was already supreme in their thinking. Because look what he says. It's a heavenly calling. And in order to do that, you fix your thoughts on Jesus. How do I understand more about heaven? Understand more about Jesus. Goes on to say, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Well, an apostle, the word, uh, which in Greek is very close to that, really means like a delegate, an ambassador. So, I mean, as far as understanding who God is, here is God's ambassador, his delegate, his, 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 you know, messenger. On top of that, besides being an apostle, he's calling him, he's also a high priest. A high priest in the Jewish faith was the one who went into the temple of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and made the once a year Yom Kippur kind of sacrifices for the sins of the people. That's a high priest. You know, that you need, you know, I mean, how important is that to have your sins forgiven? And it likens Jesus unto an apostle and a high priest. So just in this one passage, if you want to understand heavenly calling, see Jesus. If you want to have a representative of what heaven's like, see the apostle Jesus. If you want to have your sins forgiven, see the high priest Jesus. All in one verse. That is a big picture of who Christ is. Verse 2. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. So Christ, who's we've been talking about, was faithful to the one who appointed him. God. And then it likens him unto, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. And Moses was a leader and example in many ways, and you know, the main one of the main figures in the early Jewish. Start after Abraham, you know, you start talking about people who made a big difference. Ab uh, Moses is right there. You know, he was, he was big. But he's making a point here in Hebrews. And the point comes up in verse 3. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses. Why is he telling them this? Because if you're just going to stick in the Old Testament and the Jewish faith, Moses is the biggie guy. He, brought the, he gave the law. He, he was chosen of God. He, he worked miracles. But he's going on to explain, Jesus is above that. You know, even though you, you, you think highly of Moses, he was a great guy, Jesus is above even him. And it goes on to say in the rest of that passage, just as the builder of the house has greater honor than the house itself. Now think of what he's saying. He just got through, we just got through seeing that word. Moses was faithful in all God's house. 
And of course, he helped set up the early tabernacle. He helped with the, the rules, the plans, the Ten Commandments. He's a, he was a mover and shaker as far as early, early Jewish faith goes. And Jesus is better than that. He says, God's house. Well, now he's saying, Jesus is worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house is greater than the honor, uh, greater, of greater, has greater honor than the house itself. Well, if we put the analogy together, he's saying Moses worked in God's temple, but Jesus built the temple. That same parallel, right? He's working in God's house, but, he, but the builder of the house was served greater honor. He's been talking about Jesus being greater than Moses. And here he's making a point, and this is a whole other study, a whole other time, is we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem, manger stuff. We know he ran around for a while at the age of 30. He did his ministry stuff. We know all that. But he pre-existed before that. And there are many verses that talk about him and exist. They, they see the Old Testament as being written by him sometimes, or through the Holy Spirit, or a combination of all the above. They see that all the verses pointing to him. Was Melchizedek a type of Christ, or was he Christ? Was the guy in the fiery uh, uh, thing, was he Christ or a type of Christ in the fiery furnace with uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? Was uh, Christ present and all these different things? Because Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. He also says he saw Satan fall. How could you do this at the ripe old age of 30? He's talking to himself about being there in some form or another. Not necessarily the form we know in the New Testament of a human being uh, who would be the sacrifice for our sins, but in some aspect. I don't want to spend too much time because the more time I try to figure it out, I'll probably come up with some ideas that aren't even being mentioned. But clearly, Christ talks about himself existing. Uh, in fact, uh, and it's, this, it's a very good point. These aren't... Uh, antiquated just because we're out of an old Bible. The house, uh, the, the builder of the house has a greater honor than the house itself. Does anybody know who Frank Lloyd Wright is? Yeah, he's a famous architect. Why? Because of the stuff he built. Now, do you just walk around and go, my, that's a mighty fine house. No, you don't care what you're reading. You'll start talking about the guy who built it. Just that simple, greater honor. In fact, if you look up famous uh, American architects, top ten list, whatever else, uh, he's going to be in there, top top five, top three. I mean, there's other ones. The, uh, who was it? Brennan. Brennan did Chicago stuff. And who's the guy to the World Trade Center? Chinese American. P-E-I. I don't even know how it's pronounced, so I'll just stop right there. But anyway, famous architects, you know them because of the buildings. We still talk about them. Well, he's still, the writer of Hebrews is still making a similar point. Verse 5. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Yeah. He's summing it up. Verse 5. Moses was a faithful servant in all God's house, uh, a bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. And this is a reoccurring theme that many of the things that happened in the Old Testament were just type and shadow of what would come. I mentioned Melchizedek earlier. He's not mentioned too much. He's mentioned real quick with Abraham and the, the Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot stuff, time. He shows up. Uh, Abraham gives him some offering. Uh, you know what he does? This prince of peace. He's, he's, the, he's, the, he's the king of Salem. He's a prince of peace. He's the, this Melchizedek. He offers him bread and wine. Communion? Is it a form of communion? Is that a type of Christ offering communion to Abraham? Uh, I'm not saying it is, but certainly you can see the parallel. Here is it. And then the other time it's mentioned in Psalms. Melchizedek, you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek forever. And that's quoted again in the New Testament referring to Christ. So it's not a big jump to wonder, was that some form or appearance of Christ? They're called Christophanies. Old Testament appearances of what might be Christ. Or at least theophanies, a physical representation of God in some form or another we can understand. These, where God is... Like, so when uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees the guy in the fiery furnace, he says it looks, like, it looks like the son of the gods when he sees this extra person in the fiery furnace. 
maybe Jesus. A bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future, that all these things are pointing towards Christ. And again, if we think about the things he did, the things he said, the things written about him, and even the Old Testament prophecies and allusions and things pointing to him, he's just getting bigger and bigger by just the scriptures alone, not by uh, man elevating him or bringing up myths or making up stories. And we talked a while back about myths are added to people. Stories can be told. We talked about some that were added to George Washington. We talked about fallacies that can be found. Remember I brought up uh, Abraham Lincoln. There's a movie called Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Probably didn't happen. You know what I'm saying? But you'll see the movie where Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln ran around as a, as a vampire hunter. So there are myths. They are built on. They are added on. But this is early Christianity. This is going back to the first century. And we see Christ is elevated to the highest. <clears throat> Verse 6. But Christ is a faithful servant as a son over God's house. And we are in his ha- we are his house if we indeed hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So Christ is a faithful servant over God's house, and guess what? We are in this house. We are part of God. In fact, was, I told you before those verses about uh, uh, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's, that's what it means. People, I said, often use that in other forms. They mean like, hey, we need to dress up before we come to church nice with the temple of the Holy Spirit. I've seen that written on web pages. Or we need to exercise more or diet just right. I've seen that verse used to support more exercise, more diet, because we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not the point it's trying to make. God works through you. God is in you, around you, working through you. You are a building block of God's current temple on this earth. And the holiness that takes place and the teachings that take place and the reverence that takes place can all work through you because you're one of God's building blocks. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, I think it is, the Apostle Paul makes that phrase again. He does it again in 6 when he's talking about sexual morality, uh, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But in 3, he's using the building blocks of the church, the temple, is in, in his illustration that you are... God's holy temple, God's uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. It says, so we're his house, and then if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the f- hope in which we glory. Now, we could just sum that up quickly. He's telling you to keep on keeping on. Might be an easy way to say that, right? Indeed, we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Keep doing what you've been doing. Stay true to the faith. This is a reoccurring theme in the Bible, to encourage one another. Why do you suppose that is? Because you can become discouraged. You can wander away uh, from following the Lord. You can, you can get distracted and lost in your path. Uh, I've seen it happen many times. You know, I've seen... Uh, People who are really just on fire for a while. They just seem to be so catching on. And then, you know, sometimes it's gradual. Miss a Sunday, miss a few Sundays. Pretty soon you catch up to them. You finally get a chance to talk to them. All right, I'm just not doing it anymore. It's just not working for me. How did you go from point A to point B? Sometimes it happens quickly. Now, what happens? What is it that causes people to get discouraged? And I'm only going to give you a couple examples. There's multiple ones. The biggest one is other people. It's true. We talk about this all the time. Other people are messy. They're opinionated. They're all trying to help or hurt. They all got ideas. You know, they might say they're going to do something. Don't do it. They let you down. Now, this can happen. It doesn't just happen in church. It can happen with any people. I talk about teamster meetings and the way those went sometimes or coworkers or Little league meetings or probably PTA meetings. Anytime you get a bunch of people together, the dynamic is there, which is people. And it can be discouraging sometimes working alongside some of these people. I agree. But it's not always discouraging. Sometimes it's the best thing that could happen in this life is to have someone come alongside you and tell you to hang in there. Tell you, they tell you they got your six. You're the, you're the wing man. They're going to be there for you. You know what it takes for that to happen? other people. 
So the same thing that can be the problem is also one of the best helps you can get. Uh, and there are two extremes. One would be to only look for people for your help, and in that case, you just go to a bar or the Moose Lodge or the Elks Club, right? And you try to have that people help. Uh, the other is just to stay home, read your Bible, and try to deny people altogether. And again, that one is a much easier path and much less frustration. However, that's not what it's talking about here. It's always talking about people, working with people, together with people. He's talking in plural to the people he's addressing. And you need to be encouraged. Why? Because you can be discouraged. And of course, we don't need to go into it greatly. But besides all the people problems, there can be sin. There can be something you like doing better than what God wants you to do. And maybe it's a slip at first, maybe not. You know, everyone, confess your sins one to another. That's a verse that implies there might be some sins to confess. So I'm not saying if you have a sin, you've, you've instantly uh, disqualified yourself. But if someone really gets a habit going, you'll see them start to drift away. I talk about, I notice it first in church attendance. But then as I talk to them and get to know them or see them somewhere around town, and we do talk, you can tell, no, it's not just they're missing church. They've left a lot behind. They've left prayer behind and faith and fellowship, you know, and have meandered off. So what is this? It is an encouragement to hold firmly to our confidence and to the hope in which we glory. He uses the word confidence. Do you know you can be confident in the Lord? Now, I am not saying you can be confident of your physical abilities. And some people are, you know. Uh, some people, you know, the older I get, uh, I don't walk as steady as I used to. I used to be very sure-footed when I was younger. I used to skateboard. I don't see myself doing that now, right? I just don't see myself doing that now. And things have changed. You know, I, I, I admit that. Uh, but where was I going with this? Help me out. I was counting on you. I was counting on you. Okay, no. Anyway, the point, the point which I completely forgot what I was about to make, is that uh, I wish I could get back to it. I think it would have been pretty good. Huh. That's okay. These things happen once in a while. It's part of that age thing. <clears throat> oh, the confidence. The confidence. That's it. Confidence. Well, that confidence failed. So my physical thing or my intellectual ability or whatever, these confidences can fail. I'm going to talk about confidence in yourself. This kind of confidence is who God is, what he does, and he continues to do it with you. You have confidence in him because he's who he is and he says who he is. I've talked about that. You know, some people have great confidence. They're going to show up on time when they say to. That's the kind of people they are. Other people that don't show up, I'm not too worried because they're the kind of people who don't always show up on time. That's the way people are. You can have a confidence that God is always there because there's a time when you didn't think he was and it worked out. There'll be another time in your life when all look lost, you've just felt distant and far from God, and you find out you weren't. God still remembered you. He still tried to care for you, watch over you. Well, as you build a pretty good case, that is a God you can be confident in. And that's what we're talking about here, to have our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Now, earlier when we started service, I read from Psalms 95. In fact, it's even playing on the TV in the other room for added bonus. But it's only the first part. The writer of Hebrews now, quote, now writes, quotes, the entire second part of Psalms 95. This is a double bonus. Not only are we in the New Testament, we're simultaneously in the Old Testament. And for those who think, gee, we never go in the book of Psalms, gee, we never go in the book of Hebrews, Check both those boxes today. What does he say? What does he quote? Well, he starts off with verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, who does he think wrote the Old Testament? The Holy Spirit. Working through people, but it's the Holy Spirit. That would explain all the prophecy stuff coming true. You're going to need a little extra help for that. You can't just good guess that. Today, if you hear his voice, and then the rest of it, verse 8, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. 
He's talking about the time of Moses. He's talking about after they left Egypt. He's talking about wandering in the wilderness. You know, my ideas always go back to Charlton Heston stumbling around. Uh, can't help it. Grew up with it. Do not harden your hearts. It, now this puts, uh, he's talking to them. Your hearts can be hardened. And you can do something, to, I guess, to encourage it or decrease it based on this. Otherwise, there's no point in him telling you not to do it. Apparently, you have some ability to stop your heart from being hardened or to encourage them to stay soft with, you know, for the Lord. And then it says, as you did in rebellion. He's not saying they were there in the desert those centuries before, century and a half before. He's saying the people, his, their ancestors, they're famous for this kind of thing. They've done it before. It's written in the scriptures. Think about that. They saw the plagues. They saw the Passover. They saw the sea part. They saw all these things. And it wasn't too long before they made a golden calf and decided to worship it. But they saw these things. What happened? Their hearts got hard. They didn't wait for God. They didn't see the, all, they didn't put all the pieces together. And they, said, and they were there. Well, if you took care of us there and you took care of us there, chances are he'll take care of us here. Not Moses have been gone a long time. We need to do something. Let's make a golden calf is the plan they came up with. During a time of testing in the wilderness, verse 9, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. God now, quoting God, from Psalms, making the same point. They saw what I did, and it didn't work. It did, they didn't remember it. They didn't put the pieces together. They didn't have any confidence because they kept running astray everywhere. Anytime there was a new problem, a new this, a new that, well, we need to do something else, a new God, a new cure, a new this. Forty years went by. Then verse 10 he explains, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. Verse 11, so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Quoting from Psalms 95. Talking about the time in the wilderness. Uh, their hearts are always, verse 10, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. Well, I turn on the TV. It doesn't take too long before I see the next crime, the next shooting, the next this, the next that, and clearly hearts have gone astray, and they have not known my ways. And then I see anti-religious Christian protests and anti-religious videos online and, anti and people ridiculing and making fun and all these different things. Clearly, we live in a time where hearts have gone astray and they do not know his ways. Uh, Bible verses, just as true now as they were back then. And then what happened then? So I declared an oath in my anger that it shall never enter my rest. They will never enter the promised land is the most obvious thing he's talking about in the most literal sense. And many didn't. Do you know how many people the original made it into the promised land? Two. Two. I knew you'd know that. And Moses did get to see it from afar on top of a mountain. He did get to see the promised land. Out of the entire generation that came out, of all the people that came out of Egypt, they all died in the desert over those 40 years besides two. That's judgment. Why does he say this? Verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So not only can you help yourself by not having a hardened heart, here we can help each other. We can help each other. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. The two easiest ways to do that are with your words and your deeds. You can encourage someone verbally. You can encourage someone by the way you treat them, how you interact with them, if you make time for them. Think about that. Time. Time. Very hard to do nowadays. We've got so much to do. Well, we have all these appliances which are supposed to save us time. All these transportation devices which are supposed to save us time. In fact, there's so many things on my cell phone which are supposed to help me save me, like a calendar and a calculator and a date planner and an alarm clock and all these things which would have took time to manual, all right here at my fingertips. 
and we don't have time for one another. I think of the classic argument, I'm not talking about you, where a husband and wife argue, you don't love me. And the reply is, yes, I do. If you did, you would spend time with me. I heard that more than once over the years from, not necessarily you, but from other couples I've worked with over time. So what can you do to help someone? Spend time with them. And you've got words that will help. Hang in there. Be strong. I'll come pick you up for church next week. Are you in a Bible study? I'll bring you to one. Do you know why I bring these things up a lot? It's not just to build a church. These things actually help. Many people, including those in the room today, find that reading their Bibles and going to church and focusing on God help. They experience God. Now remember, it's not just about experiencing God uh, and intellectually speaking, there is a whole emotional, spiritual thing. I'm not trying to leave that part out. But you can, and that you can do alone. That you can do by the lake. I get that. But you can't do it all that way. And you certainly can't be encouraged by others if you're sitting by yourself praying somewhere. Should you sit by yourself and pray? Of course. But should that be all you're doing? No. No. So you can encourage. Right? See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away to God. Be encouraged another one daily, verse 12. So long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I told you, regular life frustrations can take you down. But this one's talking about sin taking you down. And think about that. Just in the last bit of news I've seen online and such. I've seen fires in places I thought were tropical paradises. And as recently as this morning, floods in places we call deserts. How is this so? All these things going on and more. And highway troubles and things. But all those things can wear you down. But this one here, hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You're not just hardened by sin. It's fooling you. It's making you think that this path is okay. Or you're on this path and everyone else does it. You might as well too. Or it's not going to have a big effect on you. Everybody does it a little bit. It says it's deceitful. It's deceitful. What's that famous one? Sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, cost you more than you ever wanted, and there's a third part to it. No, it was just the application. I should have wrote it down. There's just the application of the different things sin will do. You know, it seems so harmless at first. Just a little something. You can justify it. But one leads to another, leads to another. It grows and grows and grows. And eventually it fools you and your heart becomes hardened. And if we go back up, not a good place to be according to God. Verse 14. We have come to share in Christ. If we, if we indeed hold to our original convictions firmly to the very end. Verse 15. As it has just been said, he says it again. Today, if you've heard his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. He's reminding them again. He's quoting Psalm 95 again. In fact, you know what he quotes a lot in Hebrews chapter 4? Psalms 95. He's not done yet. He's not done, he or she. Uh, he's not done. Today, if you hear his voice, how do you hear his voice? All those things I've just told you about. In fact, if you're not even sure, you could get together with other Christians. Well, how do you know his voice? And many of us will say, well, it's not an easy thing. It, it usually, uh, you can get better with practice, much like anything in life. You know, how do you know when someone loves you? When you're a teenager, that's a big question. How do you know if you love anybody or if you're in love? When you're a young person, that's a big question. But over time, you get a feeling. You got a pretty good idea if someone loves you or not. You know, it's, it's not a mystery anymore, or if you love someone. Well, you hear his voice. How do you hear his voice? Well, clearly, a, a good sermon may have a couple points in it. Reading the scriptures could have a couple points in it. I told you, I've always been interested, to me, when there's coincidences beyond coincidence. Don't get me wrong, if I saw a faith healing, that'd be pretty impressive. You know, someone grew a limb back like in the Old Testament or whatever. I mean, that's, that's, that'd be pretty impressive. I'd remember that. But to me, a lot of times it's coincidence beyond coincidence to where it ain't coincidence no more. 
you know, like I didn't think I could do this and God came through and I didn't do this. And someone called and said something. Someone else called and said the same verse. There was a part where even if I don't want to hear it, I'm clearly getting the same message from God and I will accept it. You know, be it uh, sit down and shut up or stand up and fight. Both of those can be difficult at times. You can hear his voice unless your heart is hardened. And he makes this point and finishes up, verse 16. Who were they who heard and rebelled? I mean, who were these people? He answers it. Were they not all those who Moses led out of Egypt? They were the chosen. They had seen it all. They're the ones who heard, but they rebelled. Verse 17. And with whom he was angry for 40 years. Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in a wilderness? Verse 18, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his and uh, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? Now what point is he making now? It's very clear. You're not going to enter God's rest with disobeying him. You have to obey him. Many of us Christians talk about a frustration with God in our earlier walk, a, a tension. We want to walk with God. But we kind of want to do what we want to do. I told you in mine, there was a thing where I thought, if this Bible is real, I should do it. And then I would think, if I start doing this, everyone's going to think I think it's real. You know, and I was kind of left in this conundrum for a while, a month or two as I remember. What am I going to do about this? Well, many Christians call it, you surrender. You give up fighting. Because you're fighting against God and you're not going to win. So we see verse 19, they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And that's how Hebrews chapter 3 ends, and chapter 4 starts. His final point, they were not able to enter. So the point has already been made several times. We'll make it one more time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. He's talking about the wilderness but we could be talking about your teenage rebellion, your current rebellion. Don't harden your heart. Hear his word. And we've already gone over. You can hear it many different ways, many different places. Uh, start off by admitting it and getting in a groove. Talk to some people. I'm not saying you have to go join a church instantly and sign up to be a deacon or a deaconess or whatever. But... Don't hear his voice. You can hear his voice. It can become clear. Not necessarily audibly, but so much. Of, Christians also talk about, I had an urge to come to church today. And they'll even say, I can even think of some of you have said this, and I never had that urge before. Or they've lived their entire adult lives without thinking much about it. And they went, and another person said, something clicked. I'm quoting a few different people in the room now, in their stories. Something clicked. I needed to go to church. I just overwhelmed. God's talking to you, and you obey. You can hear him today. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you again for this time. Your word, your fellowship, your church. May we find our rest, our peace in you. May our hearts be soft to hear your word. May we live our lives in according to your will, dear Lord. May we be evidence of what your grace can do. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.